Welcome to the USGF webinar series. My name is Mitchell Palacio. I am the president of the United States Judo Federation. Our guest today is Sensei Janet Johnson. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Chuck Madani. Well, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And welcome to the continuing USJF seminar series. Uh, as you just heard, I'm Chuck Madani, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, as many or most of you know, the USJF has been holding these monthly or bimonthly presentations and discussions for a little over a year now with a variety of topics of interest to individual members and especially club owners and teachers addressing topics including club ownership, maintaining enrollment, coaching, teaching, and so on. Uh, our presenters have been experts in their areas or have been instrumental in the advancement of judo through their dedication to the sport, as we have seen month after month. And the webinars have given us all the opportunity to sit virtually with them, learn from them, and speak directly with them. They're no longer just names, but real people, real judokas, who have laid the foundations of the community of judo. And today we continue that theme of community with special guest Janet Johnson. Although most of us know or know of her as an IJF referee, referee evaluator and chief referee, we likely don't know much about her story, including her original path to sports, her career as a teacher, her change in professional direction, and her level of academic achievement. In addition to being an IJFA referee, she's the recipient of the Jeremy Glick Award and holds the Kodokan rank of Rokudan. She's the president of Niagara Judo Yudan Shikai in her spare time and has been a member of the USJF Board of Directors and Board of Examiners for many years. Today, Janet will be speaking about her judo career, its integration with her professional career, and her path to the highest level of certification as an international referee. Her story should also motivate those who aspire to a similar goal of excellence in teaching and officiating in our sport. And with that, it's my privilege to welcome Janet Johnson to the USJF webinar series. Good afternoon, Janet. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I think we should get right back, right, right into it. Uh, Janet's got a lot of things to talk about and a lot of things to tell us about. But first, let's do the important part. Uh, she has a couple of pets at home, and four of them are sort of low, low level pets or lower level pets. But one of her pets is. 17 hands high and his name is Ronan um, could you expand on that you told me you have 11 acres and yeah, he's he's not at my house though I board him at a, at a stable okay all but right which means he is a horse right he's a horse yeah <laughs> yes, thank you Janet we've talked a bunch about about how you came up through judo and and what you did when you were younger and I think it's it's very interesting because, as I mentioned before, um, I've known you as a an IJFA referee. You are the chief referee in ten thousand places at once, it seems, and that that's how I I know you. Although we've spoken briefly before, uh, but it's it's a whole lot deeper than that. I think. Can you tell us about the sports you did in high school and how that evolved into what you were going to do? for your career and in college. Okay. Um, I did play judo from the time I was 10 years old on, so that included high school. But I also played soccer, and I swam, and I played volleyball in high school and was a you know varsity letter person in all three of those sports. Um, swimming was probably my least successful, mostly because they put me where they needed me. So I swam the 100 fly and the 500 free, which are back-to-back -back events, which meant you climbed out of the fly, got right back on the mounting block, and off you went for the, for the 500 free. Um, the volleyball was probably my favorite, and I was Section 5 MVP uh, my senior year in high school. And I continued to play uh, volleyball in college and afterwards. And then I also... Uh, did one year of softball and three years of soccer in high yeah. school, in addition to the judo. That's really impressive. But that, that had an effect on what you decided to do for your career initially, didn't it? Yes. Um, I had decided, I, I knew I wanted to teach, and I decided to go into physical education. So uh, my, my first major was physical education um, when I went to college looked at 10 places, got accepted at all of them, and then realized that 
at nine out of the 10, they were asking me to become the head instructor um, in judo. And I knew that I needed more instruction than that. So um, I chose to stay at Brockport because that's where I was gonna get the best judo instruction. And they have a great phys ed program as well. So I started off as a phys ed major, um, but partway through, I decided that um, I looked in the area, I knew I wanted to stay in the area and that the only positions that were gonna open were in high school phys ed. So I decided to get an elementary education degree in addition to that. So when I graduated, I had um, physical education, K-12, elementary education, nursery school through sixth grade, and an undeclared minor in foreign languages that was kind of a fluke. <laughs> so, um, uh, How many languages do you have to speak to get a minor? Um, you only actually need to do one, but I had taken um, quite a bit of French, um, some Spanish, one semester of Italian, and one semester of Chinese. Well, you, you had a long teaching career then, and I guess, oh, first of all, you, you became a shodan early on uh, after a few years. Uh, what was that like? Uh, you, you're pretty young. It, I was um, 17, which was the minimum age at the time, um, and I had to work very, very hard. My sensei, who was my dad, was a very demanding instructor. So in addition to having the competition points and all the Gokyo no Waza that you needed and everything else, um, he made me do um, the entire Nage no Kata as Uke and Tori, Juno Kata as Uke and Tori, Karame no Kata as Uke and Tori, and Kimeshiki for my um, shodan, for the Kata portion. A significant disadvantage for having a great judo uh, as a judoka as a father. It was, it was challenging, but it was pretty amazing too. And you know, the people that he brought in, the people that he hosted, um, taught me a tremendous amount. Um, I met Miss Fukuda when I was ten years old. You know, I, I was a a little kid in a white belt, and she pulled me over into the corner and sat me down and basically taught me Kimishiki in two nights. Um, when I was 10 and, and she didn't speak any English at that point in time um, other than no, 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 and, and good. <laughs> Those were the only two words that she spoke in English. And uh, it was a pretty amazing experience. Well, you also had this, uh, this long career as an elementary school teacher. And if so you... go ahead, tell us about your, your elementary school training and your okay. academic credentials and, and what mm -hmm. happened during your career? Okay, I, uh, I taught for 33 years um, at, at the same school in the same building um, between kindergarten, first grade, looping kids from kindergarten to first grade, doing a multi-age classroom, and then eventually going where my passion was, which was um, universal pre-kindergarten. Um, during the course of that time, I you know, progressed not only as a teacher, but I also progressed as a referee. And when I was getting on into the IJF A level and B level and A level both, I was having to take time off of work in order to travel. And so the agreement that I had with the district at the time is that I would take um, a pay cut every time that I went on a trip, they deducted one two hundredth of my gross annual salary per day from my pay. <laughs> and, uh, and so I didn't ever take time off for sick time or anything like that. I did it up front. And everything was really, really good until um, the last superintendent that I had before, um, uh, wh while I was still actively refereeing internationally. Um, I got back from the World Cadet Championships and they called me in and they said, you know, we've decided that we're not going to pay you to travel anymore. So we're not going to let you referee um, and taking the time off from refereeing. And I said, wait a minute, you don't pay me. Um, you're, you're deducting one two hundredth of my gross annual salary per day. I've never had a complaint about the lesson plans that I've you know, given a person. I've never had a complaint from parents and I was brought back something for the children so that they could take something home from every country that I went to. Um, and he said, uh, too bad, sorry, 
you weren't not going to let you travel. So it brought my career to an abrupt halt as far as international travel was concerned. We certainly made up for it traveling domestically. Yep. Uh, <laughs> it just, just dawned on me. Have you ever counted the number of times you've been a chief referee? No. I, know, I, think it's I like, don't think I want to like know. 25,000 25, or something like that. I just, it's a lot. Now, okay, now you've spoken about the elementary part, the elementary education mm -hmm. and, and some of the administrative challenges there. But can you talk about the, the, the way that coaching and teaching in an elementary school can help inform each other? because you've word, used the word nurturing in the past. And I'm very interested to see how you, or to hear how, how you would explain the interaction and how they help support each other and what we can learn from it. Okay. I've always felt very strongly that, you know, especially with children, but even with adults, that um, one of your main goals as, a, as an instructor is to develop the entire person, which means you are nurturing them um, not only academically and intellectually, but you need to nurture their soul as well. So you need to be addressing um, values and you need to be addressing confidence and you need to be addressing um, self-worth and all those other kinds of things. So it's, so to me, teaching is not just about, you know, learning to read, learning to write, learning to do osurogari. <laughs> it's about, um, developing the entire person and that requires mutual respect i think one of the things i learned from my sensei is is that respect should not ever be demanded it's something that's earned and i think that students get a very strong sense of that when you have that kind of connection with them and develop that kind of connection so to me it doesn't it it didn't matter whether I was teaching swimming or I was teaching judo or I was teaching kindergarten um, or first grade that when I'm, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to develop the entire person. And I also think that it's very important that um, you always try to get people to go beyond what you have ever been able to do. So my, my goal is not just to teach a kid to do something, but I've had a number of students come back to me afterwards and say, you know, I remember this thing that we did in kindergarten and it carried me through. And now I'm a neuroscientist, <laughs> you know, or now I'm, you know, the president of this company or I'm doing something else. And I think that that's important. My dad always told me that, you know, his goal as a, as a judoka was to have people go further and further than he ever was able to get and to learn more and to be able to do more than he ever could do. And he said, every good instructor should be like that. And I truly take that to heart, that you always want your students to do better than you have ever been able to do. Can you give us some, uh, some idea of, of how one develops that? I mean, the, to, to you and, well, I see that Krista's here, Krista Tsui, Steele, and you're, you're both professional educators and maybe it's second nature to you. But for many of us on this call and throughout, probably throughout the country, people who are um, leaders of clubs, it may be difficult to even think about how to start that process. Any tips on that? Well, I think a, a huge part of my educational training was that you need to treat each person as an individual, um, that you can't take every kid and teach them the same thing at the same way at the same time, um, because they don't process like that. You know, everybody's unique in, in how they take in information. Everybody's unique in how they give it back out. Everybody's unique in the amount of time that it takes them to, to um, acquire new skills and new things. And so individualization is very important. Um, being able to differentiate what you do so that it's appropriate for every kid to be exposed to a similar concept, but you're not gonna make the exact same demand of their performance level at the exact same time and have that be the expectation. You know, the, the first time that you teach anything, whether it's um, how to sound out a word or whether it's um, how to perform a breakfall, not every student is going to acquire that knowledge in the same amount of time and in the same way. 
Some people need to see it. Some people need to feel it. Some people need to hear it. You know, there, there's just so many different ways that people input information. But then, you know, not only is it how do you deliver that, but then it's the, the communication back and forth that's really important. That I need, you know, if, if I'm going to help you figure out a problem, I need to hear where you are in the problem. Where, where are you stuck? What have you thought through and those kinds of things and and it doesn't matter whether the problem is how do you decode this word or how do i learn to read nawaza better as a referee i need to know what you're thinking before i can help address it a hundred percent we talk about uh, uh, principles of honesty integrity mutual welfare that's a little bit different but it's really important that because we hear about it all the time and, and it really sinks in as you get older but is there any particular way that kids learn those principles other than let's say watching their parents uh, hopefully watching their parents uh how does this how's the teacher um uh, in the classroom or on the mat help to initiate or perhaps to encourage or reinforce those principles and is it different different rather I think that modeling is really, really important, and it needs to be genuine. Um, you know, when, when you have three and four year olds walking into a classroom for the first time, and you sit them down, and you say, okay, this is my house, this is, this is my place, I'm sharing all of my toys with you, I'm sharing all of my things with you. And I expect that we are going to share with each other. Um, in the judo class, it's, you know, we're, we're all working on things together. But the most important thing is that you become the best person that you can be. And so we talk a lot about, you know, honesty and, you know, the importance of always telling the truth and being honest and um, talking about things like uh, having um, a sense of trust with the people that you're working with, having integrity, having um, the willingness to work through something, even if it's hard, um, that you you don't give up, but but not giving up doesn't mean you do the same thing the same way over and over and over again. If something's not working, you you ask for help to try to figure out a new way to approach it so that it's not going to be the same struggle your entire life. Um, I think that those kinds of of things, you know, the honesty and integrity, the mutual welfare, the helping each other the trying to learn, trying to continue to be a learner and trying to become the best person that you can be are all really valuable things. So embedded in in everything I did in my classroom and embedded in everything I do with my my children in judo um, are those those values as well as whatever content I'm trying to teach. Uh, Is there a way that that we as teachers, sorry, we as teachers in the dojo who have Mm -hmm. young people, just about anybody, but young people, teens, uh, adolescents, um, is there any way that we can um, seek out people to give us uh, some sort of help or reinforcement? Do we seek out our our local teachers? Uh, What would be a good practical way of doing that? And I know that we haven't spoken about that before, but it dawned on me that, that you got like hundreds of people across the country, thousands of people across the country who say, all right, this is how you do Osotagari, and uh, and it doesn't click. Or be honest, everybody, and it doesn't click. <laughs> or, you know, mm-hmm. I, you know, they ignore you. Right. Uh, any, any ideas on that? I think you can look within your community and find people that, that mirror the, the values that you, you have and that you want to express. And, and either, you know, communicate with those people or invite them in to do things with you to touch base with those kinds of, of, of individuals, because I think that that's important. We all need mentors, you know, e- even, even mentors need mentors, you know, and I think that that's a super important thing is to be able to reach out to the people in your community. Um, tapping into educators is fine as long as they have the same philosophy. Not every educator has the same philosophy. Um, and so it depends on what, what you really are valuing 
I think that going to students who have been successful and talking with them about what made the difference for you is probably just as important as going to somebody who knows more than you do um, because they can tell you what worked for them and what didn't work for them and they'll be honest about it. Um, and I think, so I think we need to do that. You need to talk to the parents of the people that you're working with and say, you know, do you, do you see things that are better? Do you see things that are not as good? And what kinds of things could we change? Um, how do you perceive what we're doing in here affecting the rest of your child's life? Um, so it's, it's reaching out to a wide variety of people. But I think the one, the one that we tend to forget are students you know, past students and trying to reach out to them and saying, you know, you, you've contacted me and you said judo has made a big difference in your life. Can you tell me why? Can you tell me what it was so that I can keep doing the right thing? Or if something wasn't good, I need to know so I can change it. And you know, I think that's another thing that we need to be really honest with our students about is if something's not working for you, you need to let me know because I can't fix it if I don't know it's broken. Before we end the the teaching of judo part of this, uh, you've also told me that you've developed kata, interna international players and medalists in kata. And uh, I wouldn't say I've developed them; I've helped them. <laughs> you, you've helped but, them, rather. Okay. But I, I think every every person who's gotten to an international level in kata has certainly had more than one person working with them. Sure. And so I certainly can't take credit for that. There there are some people I've worked with. You know, but but you but you have contributed to their advancement. Some. Uh, let's assume. Okay, that's for all of us. That's for all of us. Let's move over to something that you may be familiar with, and that's um, it's uh, oh refereeing, refereeing. Uh, okay, how'd you get started in this thing? And I remember you once told me about about your dad on the way to the AMCANs. So don't forget that one. All right. So yeah, I will so put that one in too. Roll along. Tell us, yeah. tell us how you did this. I, I started off by um, when we would host these little mini tournaments. And this was decades ago when they used blocks on a stick to, to show the scores, um, doing a lot of scorekeeping for my dad while he was refereeing. And then I would go to tournaments and there either wouldn't be anybody for me to compete against or the division was very small and was over in like three minutes. Um, he would have me start refereeing. And that, that was back when it was okay to do it in a judo gi. Um, so, you know, it, it was a much different world back then. And so I'd compete. And if there was nobody for me to compete against or when my division was done, I'd start refereeing. Um, what, uh, what Chuck is alluding to is that one day we were heading off to the AMCAN challenge and uh, dad threw this thing at me and he was driving <laughs> and the rule book hit my lap. <laughs> I was looking at it and I said, um, why are you giving this to me? It's, an, it's a, about an hour and 15 minute trip to the AMCANs from our house. And he said, you might wanna read that. And I said, why? He said, cause you're taking the national exam. <laughs> and he said, oh, and by the way, you need to go to the store and get you know, a jacket and the pants and the shirt and the, you know, because I had absolutely no idea I was going to be taking the national exam when it happened. So, you know, surprise. And of course it was, um, yes, dad. Yeah, like so many of us, yes, after, dad. after the, are you crazy? And then he's, you know, when we're almost all the way there, he said, okay, so you just read the rule book. Do you have any questions? <laughs> I was like, why now? <laughs> Couldn't you give me the book like a week ago? <laughs> But, Mate. Yeah, Mate. yeah, but he, he was, he was always surprising me like that. You know, the, we, you know, going back to the uh, kata thing, he did teach me, you know, almost all of the kata that I knew, you know, with, with people like Miss Fukuda helping and, and, you know, other, other senseis helping. Um, but he taught me how to do kimishiki, which includes um, some knives and swords. And as a little kid, you know, he would always use the wooden weapons and we would do that. But you have to remember the man was um, from a samurai family. So when he attacked, he was, you know, I, that wooden thing would have left a major dent if I hadn't gotten out of the way. When I was 12, we were giving a, um, a demonstration in the middle of a tournament. And um, I can't see diddly squat without my glasses on. 
So, you know, we did the bowing in and everything. And we got to the first technique where there was a knife and something flashed. Wood doesn't flash. I realized that that was not a wooden knife that he was pulling on me. And the attack came at 900 miles an hour. And fortunately, you always knew exactly where he was going to attack. So it was really easy to not be there. But I've never moved so fast in my life. And then I was shaken like a leaf through the entire yeah. remainder because I knew there were more knives coming and swords. <laughs> and so, how, how old were you at that point? 12. Oh yeah, my oh yeah, my father attacked me with knives and uh, and swords mm -hmm. when I was twelve years old. I didn't mm -hmm. know it was coming. Yeah. yeah, and then to make a point, you know, they they had a little party after the the tournament, and he used the sword that he drew on me to cut the watermelon. <laughs> so he just wanted everybody to know it was a real weapon. <laughs> so. No videos at that point, were there? Probably not. Unfortunately, eight, no. eight millimeter. <laughs> There were, yeah, probably there were eight millimeter films back then, but I think they've been trashed since then. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people who start refereeing and they, they develop to a certain level and they say, okay, that's good. I'm a referee. Uh, you obviously didn't stop. Why? What, what motivated you to go up further in the ranks and eventually become an international IJFA? Um, I understood that the competition portion of judo is very important to develop your entire judo profile. However, I was um, a really lousy competitor because of something that happened to me fairly early on in my um, competitive career. Um, being, being a kid and not having very many women around, girls around at all, and women, you know, I always competed against senior women. I didn't compete in a junior tournament growing up and uh, you know, I have one picture where I am do I'm being held down um, and all you can see are my fingers and toes because the person was so much bigger than I was and I just you know you're, it's a long 30 seconds when you can't breathe but hmm. um, one of the reasons that that my my uh, competitive career was not good was that at one tournament I was playing um, collegiate women and I was 14 and I threw one, uh, she was you know, much bigger than I was. And um, I think I was like a green belt and she was a yellow belt or something. Um, I threw her and she freaked out midair, stuck out both arms and broke them on her way over. And the referee looked at me and said, did you have to throw her so hard? And um, my fear ever since then was that I was going to hurt somebody. So even all the years that I played in the Empire State Games and medaled, people would say, don't worry, she won't hurt you. Don't worry, she won't hurt you. Well, that's not a really great way to have a good competitive career because at some point in time, you know, if you're putting on a choke and somebody sputters a little bit, you're not supposed to say sorry and let go. <laughs> um, but I did. And so I realized that if I was going to keep um, learning through the competitive portion of judo, that I needed to do it in another way. And refereeing for me was that better way. So you, you get front and center stage and you get to see the judo from the perspective that you choose and you get to learn more about it. And so it was a way for me to continue to grow in my understanding of competitive judo without having to be the competitor. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds like that referee wasn't nurturing at all. Oh, no, um, <laughs> no. And it did make a huge impact on me because that was that was the first and only thing anybody said about the whole thing. You have done a lot of work with referees and evaluating them and teaching them and uh, assessing them for for um, advancement. Um, how did you use your your education skills and your knowledge to to make that more effective or more efficient, or was it already maximally efficient? Um, the way that I was um, nurtured through my referee development was um, not as, I think, efficient as maybe it could have been because a lot of the educational things that, that I had learned in my profession um, weren't being used. So 
it, it doesn't help when you, you ask a question and we all have heard the joke, you know, the answer that you get is, you know, judo. <laughs> and, you know, that doesn't help you understand a, a concept further. And so I tried to use um, what I knew about teaching and what I knew about having to do task analysis and where the breakdowns can be for a person um, to help you know, not only educate myself as a referee, but then to help others. Um, so a lot of times, instead of just saying, you know, that was a wasari, this is why, I would say, you know, I want, it, I want you to tell me what you saw. And that way I can go back and figure out where did, where did the breakdown happen? And then we can fix it from there. And so there's, um, there were many, many times that, um, I thought it was really important to get the input from the person about what it was that they were processing, what they thought they saw, um, what they thought the problem was, and then I could help guide them in a better direction. And I think that made the process a little bit more efficient for a lot of people. That's not unlike the process that you, you described for the kids, uh, mm -hmm. that you had to find out where they were and what they had tried before you could really help them. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's just it, because, you know, 33 years into education, it's something that's ingrained in you. So it's not something that you, you consciously say, well, I'm doing this, so I'm going to do this. It's just something that you do. A couple of words you, you used uh, when we were talking before is that, uh, well, first of all, you, you were an expert at curriculum development in the school system, uh, as you described to me. Uh, mm -hmm. But when it came, came to refereeing, you said that curriculum really didn't matter, that uh, it, it wouldn't work, and that delivery was more important. Could you explain that to me? Because when I looked over my notes, I, di I didn't understand that completely. Okay. Um, the world of refereeing is constantly changing. Um, not only do the rules change all the time, but the interpretations of them change um, the way that out, um, outside influences affect everything changes. You know, we've gone from having, you know, one referee in the middle and two on the sides to cameras everywhere, a referee in the middle. And although the judges are on the side, there's no communication at an international level. Um, having supervisors at an international level that make all the decisions. So if they don't like something, you know, you can ask them a question as a, as a judge, as a side judge, but you're not allowed to input to the referee until the supervisor gives you permission. It's a very different world, but judo is constantly changing in that refereeing perspective. So I don't think that you, anything that you put together now to say, you need to know this and this and this and this and this and this in three years, it's not going to be the same four years. It's not going to be the same. It's, it's constantly evolving. And I think that's what makes it so challenging is that um, if you're out for a couple of years and you come back, the things that you thought you knew aren't anymore. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in our refereeing development is that in order to keep our people current, we have to stay current and we're not really good at that sometimes. Ask you something about the evaluation and your assessment for referees, because there's I'm sure many people on, on this call who are at fairly high level of refereeing and they assess others. Um, is there, and this may sound silly now that I think about it, but I'm gonna give it anyway. Uh, is there a predictable progression of skills that referees develop as they proceed up the line? Uh, or is it sort of like human beings being completely different uh, and they all have different ways or different rates of progression and different steps that they take, different pathways? I think that there's um, there are logical steps that happen. You know. It, you, when you get enough experience, you can look and you say, this guy's definitely um, an N1, or this one's an N2, or this one ought to be a B, or this one ought to be an A. You can look at people and see that in the same way that you can walk into a dojo and look around and say, okay, that would be one of my, you know, green belts. That would be one of my brown belts. This guy definitely knows what he's doing. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, you know, he's a solid black belt. Um, I think there is a natural progression in some ways, but there's little individual differences. Um, but you know what what makes a national referee 
um, or a, a local referee versus a regional referee versus a national referee is is our significant steps in understanding um, the judo that's happening on the mat, and then you know going from national to higher level national to uh, Pan American or not Pan American but um, continental to IJFA. There are definite steps that have to happen. Um, but even now, I don't think that we're training our people necessarily to get to the top because we haven't always, um, as an as an organization, prepped them to understand what's coming up. You know, for example, um, the the academy, the IJF Academy, is sort of a mandate, and in order to take your B exam, you have to have, you know, you should have gone to the academy already. Um, it's not just for people on the tour, but I don't know that our people are getting that kind of information um, strongly enough and regularly enough to understand that, you know, three years ago, they needed to take the academy when it was free. And now they're going to have to pay and pay and pay to, to do that. And it's hard work. It's not an easy thing. Um, I think we give people a false sense that, you know, you can still get to A without having to do all these extra things. And that's not going to happen. Even the coaches are going to have to um, be academy certified or they're not going to be able to coach internationally. That's so interesting. so there's, there's little things like that that I think we've, we have um, sort of failed at. But on the other hand, we are getting referees and we are having people who are trying really hard to develop younger referees. There are some very creative programs coming up um, that are, are doing a nice job of trying to get, you know, competitors interested in refereeing. And um, I think that those are all wonderful, wonderful things. But we have some, um, some higher level things that we need to be considering pretty strongly too. There's been a question, uh, at least in Shufu, uh, uh, I'm around Shufu, and our president of Shufu is, is Mickey Takamori, and she's on the call. And we've talked about, um, uh, about getting younger people involved uh, earlier. Do you have any recommendations for that uh, or warnings about how not to do it or how to do it and when? I think the younger, the better. Like with... Even with, I have a teeny tiny little dojo, tiny, tiny, tiny little dojo. But even at that, when we're doing our little, you know, mock competitions with each other, I, I let the kids referee. And, you know, yeah, so I'm sort of standing over them saying, you know, look at this, move over here. But I don't correct everything that they do wrong. We kind of get it by experience. And um, I think that you can provide gentle experiences like that. There are people who are getting really gutsy out there and they're letting um, people start to referee when they're in, you know, t-shirts and, and, you know, sweatpants and that kind of thing um, to give it a go. If, you know, somebody got injured and they can't compete this week. Okay. So you got your hand wrapped up, go ahead and referee at this tournament. And I think that we need to be, a little bit more open to not necessarily having all of our refereeing happen in formal uniform, but get people started and going and comfortable with, with, you know, standard referees there to, to mentor and help out. Um, I, I'm probably not the best person to talk about this part because I don't have the experience that some of our other friends did, but I know that I've seen a lot of stuff on YouTube lately about, people who are trying to let kids and, um, you know, young, younger competitors actually doing refereeing during the competitions. And I think it's wonderful. In the last few minutes that we have, um, let me circle back just a, a bit and ask you again about um, the relationship between the, the teacher and the student, the senpai and kohai. You said that, that you celebrate your you, you celebrate the successes of your students, uh, and that's what, that's what that relationship is. Could you expand on that a little bit? Any details that you want to add to make it, to make it more practical, not practical, but, but, but hit home for the people who are on the call and those that we speak to about this? 
I think, you know, when, when kids hit um, a landmark moment, you know, whether it's they finally got a role <laughs> that they couldn't do before, or um, they come to you and they say, you know, I, I made the Dean's list this semester, or they come to you and they say, I finally sorted out this problem and I know how I'm going to deal with getting the money that I need to pay for the next semester or whatever. I think that those kinds of things need to be celebrated. You know, with, with, with my children's program, you know, we're clapping for each other all the time and hooting and hollering and cheering and saying, you know, hey, look at that. You, you got it. You got it. You worked so hard at it. Um, but with, with the older kids, I think that if you have that kind of um, celebratory relationship with them, they're more likely to come and talk to you when something good happens. They're also more likely to come and ask for assistance and you can guide them in the right direction when something goes awry. But I think that that kind of, you know, celebrating individuals, you know, is, is a really important thing. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be just, you know, hey, you got your yellow belt. Hey, you got your orange belt. But I think, you know, the smaller steps are really, really important. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, you're president of, of Niagara Yidanshikai. Uh, I guess that's pretty easy, isn't it? I mean, there's no problem. It's there, a tiny, right? <laughs> it's a teeny tiny Yudanshikai. So yeah, it's, it's. Oh wait a minute! Wait a minute! No, 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 no! What <laughs> I was saying is that it doesn't matter how small they are. You can find some real, some, some real drama in every one of them. Let mm -hmm. me skip over that. Forget I said it. <laughs> uh, one last thing, and, and this is sort of a, a summary statement. We're asking you for a summary statement, ma'am. Looking back, how would you describe your left, your life's lessons from judo and therefore encourage young people to participate because of what you've learned? That's pretty vague, but I think it's wide open. It's, Tell us it's, anything. <laughs> it's pretty vague. I think it's really important for me to say, you know, out, you know, just straight out, you have to have a mentor in life, at least one, preferably more than one. Um, without a mentor, you're not going to get anywhere. You know, I was fortunate in coming up through my refereeing career to have people who would take me under their wing and help me out. And that was important. You know, I, my sensei was my dad for decades and we've got a whole generation of up and coming referees who never heard of him. And I try not to, um, overly talk about him, you know, but he taught me a lot about the need to have a mentor and, you know, the, for, for each thing that you're trying to do, um, to have, to have mentors is, is such an important thing because you cannot grow on your own. There are things you can do to help your growth, but you also need somebody who's way above where you can perceive yourself getting to to help pull you in that direction and to make those steps. Thank you for sharing your father with us. What a great resource he was for many, many years. And thanks to him for bringing you into the sport and, and then so much clearer from this presentation today. Thank you for being a professional educator, being in our sport, the sport we love, and then going on higher and higher and higher. I think that's been um, instructive and inspirational to all of us. But I have one question. We have some great resources and, and two of them are on this screen here. The teacher certification, the coach certification, great resources, I thought. Dr. Madani was with me in Honolulu when we went through the first teacher certification uh, program and other people who are on the screen. As a professional educator, for non-professional educator judo teachers, what do you think about that resource? Does it have some value to it? Should we all go back to college and now we get a bachelor's degree in education? Share your thoughts with us and I'll, I'll mute myself again, but thanks again for sharing with us. I think taking advantage of any kind of opportunity that you have to learn more and, you know, and the resources that the USJF has had, um, has put into developing really strong programs is wonderful. So I think taking advantage of those kinds of things is really, really important. Um, I will have to admit that I haven't always done that, but part of that is because I was so heavily involved in the refereeing and it was, it was requiring 
every weekend <laughs> and you know a tremendous amount of time the taking the time to do the additional certifications which i used to have um has been very difficult for me, but I think that the wonderful resources that we have need to be used. So this is from Heiko. Heiko asks, as a referee, how do you personally keep up with the changes every four years? And the follow-up <laughs> question is, what do you find to be the most rewarding, challenging part of judo? Uh, it's not just every four years. Heiko, it's basically every year that you get a, a new flavor of, of um, refereeing rules. So you know, especially after quadrennial, you know, the first year there's going to be lots of changes and then they tweak it and then they tweak it again. And then they say in the fourth year, there are going to be no changes, but that's not entirely true either. Um, so I think, you know, continuing to be flexible about understanding what the rules are and taking advantage of all the things that are online now, you know, that you have access to um, the IJF seminars and you have access to um, things that are being done um, in other countries to develop their referees. And I think taking advantage of watching those videos and, and really studying them and talking to people about them is really important. What you can't do is listen to one single individual um, and get the entire flavor. You really need to, to make sure that you're listening to as many different ones that, that have the knowledge together. So, you know, at the IJF seminar, they they have a panel. It's not just one person talking the entire time. It's a panel of people. And I think that's important because you hear slightly different flavors of each thing um, with a panel. And and I think it's very dangerous um, in, in any profession to only listen to one person about something. His follow-up question is, what do you find to be the most rewarding and challenging part of judo? relationships. <laughs> I think, you know, developing them, maintaining them, letting them um, mature as they will is probably the most rewarding part, but it's also a very, very challenging part because we all change. We all change. Krista? Um, I'm wondering what you are most proud of um, from your judo career so far. <laughs> That's a tough one. Probably um, it's, it's partial pride and it's partial fear. Um, when my dad first came to this country, he had a judo club in Lincoln, Nebraska uh, that's still functioning. We moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. That club is still functioning. We moved to Brockport. That club is still functioning, but it's a heavy burden on my shoulders to keep it that way and to make sure that there's a, a legacy plan to keep it going. And I think, you know, that's, so for me, you know, it's, it's rewarding to know that I've been able to keep it going, but at the same time, it's terrifying, um, partially because we're connected to a college. And, uh, and so we, you know, the, the, the club in Lincoln was um, a private club. The club in Ann Arbor was at a YMCA that doesn't exist anymore, but they kept the name when they moved to their new building. Um, but we are actually, housed in a college and run by the college. So that's, that's a partial fear for me is that when that goes away, when that goes away, what am I going to do? Can I ask a follow up? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm curious about your thoughts of like the longevity of dojos and how we, I, I am a sensei's kid as well. <laughs> and how do we pass on, you know, dojo leadership and continue this sport. Um, just what are your thoughts on that? I think we need to learn from the people that came before us that, that, that the passing on has to happen earlier. Um, people need to be mentored through that change. And you can't wait until the sensei is really old and not able to do before they start thinking about what comes next. I think you need to start working on that, the, that legacy piece much, much earlier. Um, and plan as a group, um, you know, get your dojo involved and, and, you know, people around you that can help you. Because I think waiting as long as our senses did, I can't, I shouldn't speak for you, but for me, you know, my sensei and, and a lot of the ones that I know um, in my Udanshikai and, and, you know, in, in states around me, 
waited too long to start that process. Mickey? Uh, yeah, I had a completely changing the topic kind of question. Okay. Um, because everybody here loves judo. My curiosity question is, why horseback riding? How, what puts you on that path? From the minute I could say horse when I was little, <laughs> I asked for a horse. And I would get little plastic ponies, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, when I was 10, my parents found a place that, that they could afford that we could go and ride like once a week. And um, we did that for the two years before we moved to, to uh, New York. And once we were in New York, that stopped because there was no place near us that, that was available. Um, but the passion continued. So as soon as I graduated from college, I bought myself my first horse wow. and couldn't afford a really good one. So I bought a cheapie and trained it for a couple of months and then sold it for twice what I bought it for and kept doing that. You know, buy a horse, train it, sell it, buy a horse, train it, sell it, until I finally ended up with the horse I really, really wanted. And then I got engaged <laughs> and my horse was 40 or, or 25 minutes in one direction from work and my husband's house was 25 minutes in the opposite direction so i sold my horses because i knew i would never have enough time to actually see them so there was a big pause and then um when i finally got out of um school so when i retired i got into horses again um, casually riding with a friend and then ended up buying a horse, realized he was not the right horse for me, bought another one, realized she was not the right horse for me. She's got a great home now and have my, my Ronin who is the perfect horse for me. So. I think that, that pretty much wraps it up. I think, uh, I, I want to thank Janet Johnson for her time and sharing her experiences for the benefit of those on the call and those who will watch this in the future. She's obviously an IGFA referee and so much more. And possibly most important is her status of teacher, senpai, senpai of so many in the classroom and in the dojo. And our thanks to you, Janet, for all that you've done for the advancement of judo and all the things you're sure to accomplish in the future. You certainly deserve our thanks and our appreciation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this honor. I appreciate it.